Nowadays, when you think about Taiwan, if you think about Taiwan, you probably don't think of tea or hats. Certainly not asparagus, probably not ladies' shoes. You probably think about electronics. Now, Taiwan especially now is electronics. And since electronics is a very high-tech product, you might have a hard time connecting it with what's gone before in Taiwan, these, all these low-tech industries. You know, this, this high-tech industry, can, can we really you know, understand it by understanding these low-tech industries that came first? And one of the main arguments I want to make you know, in this series of lectures is that, yes, electronics is a natural outgrowth of the business environment that evolved in Taiwan over the 20th century. Now, Taiwan evolved the comparative advantage of speed intensity. It was able to you know, create these networks of small and medium enterprises that were very flexible, and they could change production very quick and keep up with the ever-changing international markets. As far as most consumer goods are concerned, the markets are ever-changing because of fashion. Right? And you know, as these different fashions came along, they're like waves. Taiwan's a surfer. Each time, they don't know what wave's going to come along next, but they're very quick to figure out how they're going to ride that wave. Right? Electronics is also a very quickly changing high-tech industry. It's not changing quickly so much because of fashion, or maybe fashion plays a little role in electronics, but mainly it's just because technology is changing so fast. Taiwan was one of the few places that could keep up with such fast changing technology. So in this section, I want to talk about the electronics industry. I'm going to first talk about how electronics comes to Taiwan, its early developments. Then I want to move on and talk about how it develops into the computer industry. And then finally, I want to say something about the semiconductor industry which is probably what Taiwan is best known for today. And semiconductors are a little bit different. When I talked about heavy industry, I said, you know, it was very hard for government and, you know, private entrepreneurs to work together. The private businesses are profit maximizing. Government often has other things in mind. There's a lot of friction. So usually that's not very successful. But in the semiconductor industry, you did have government getting involved and doing a lot of investing early on. And semiconductors did very good in Taiwan. So I want to look a little more careful at that kind of exceptional instance. And, you know, what happens here? And why was it so different than what you usually see when government tries policies like this? To begin with, you know, the prehistory of electronic industry in Taiwan is that uh, probably begins in 1948 when the first vacuum tube radio is, uh, you know, assembled in Taiwan. I think it's probably assembled from parts that, you know, maybe from mainland China. Say this is prehistory because vacuum tubes are not really electronics, as I understand it. Um, the vacuum tube radios, when I was really little, I saw one and took it apart. You know, they're, they're pretty big things. Sometimes can get really big. You open up and back, lots of tubes look like kind of weird light bulbs. Um, very different technology than what's going to come later. And by 19, you know, you know, well, 1950, that's when um, the Taiwan government starts in restricting imported radios because they don't want consumers wasting the country's um, you know, foreign exchange on these products. They think Taiwanese should be able to make their own radios. And then they gradually start restricting the, um, the imports of um, radio parts because they think that Taiwan should also be able to make the parts for these radios. Um, though they can't do this all at once because some parts are a little too hard for Taiwan to, to produce. By 1960, though, most parts are being made in Taiwan. You know, all radios are being assembled in Taiwan. You could say this was a successful import substitution um, policy because you, you do succeed in making, you know, making all your radios in Taiwan, and the government causes this success by stopping imports and you know, forcing um, Taiwanese companies to learn by doing. The problem is this is the wrong technology. You know, by 1960, I think it's getting pretty clear, vacuum tube radios are not the radio of the future. In 1955 is when Sony first started selling its transistor radio. And by 1960, it's pretty clear that transistor radios are, are the, you know, the radios that are going to dominate in the future. Transistor radios, vacuum tube radios are very different sort of products. The transistor radio first produced in Taiwan in 1961 under contract from a foreign company. 
Now, I really can't remember whether it's a Japanese or an American company, okay? but this is, a, this is a factory that's producing transistor radios for export. Since the radios are for exports, all of the, the parts are imported at the beginning. There's no restrictions on parts if you're exporting a product. If it's for the domestic market, then the government can put these controls on. And even if these controls mean that you're going to be using some pretty mediocre parts because you know, you're not that good at producing the parts in your country yet, well, you know, all the companies face the same problem in the domestic market, and so they can still make profits. Okay? The consumers just suffer somewhat because they've got mediocre radios. If you're going to export the radios, though, sell them to foreigners, you've got to have the best radio you can make, and you've got to use the best parts you can get, and so you import the parts, and the government allows that. Since Taiwan's economy is really has a very small domestic market, import substitution hasn't been as important in Taiwan as it is, has been in, in some other countries. A lot of what Taiwan produces is often first produced for the foreign market, and um, it's only later that they start producing for the domestic market. Transistor radios were that way. They're first produced in Taiwan for foreigners, not for the domestic market. Mm -hmm. okay. So the, the radios that are being made for export, they don't require parts made in Taiwan, but pretty quickly you do start seeing a parts industry form in Taiwan. Okay. They're making parts for these exported transistor radios, and that's because of holdup. Yeah. During this period, 1960s, Maybe you're starting to get some air freight, but it's really expensive. There's not much of it out there. Most parts are, are shipped by surface, you know, by shipping. Okay. You know, you never know when the parts are going to get lost, you know, or whether they're just going to be late. And then what are you going to do? You're just going to close down your factory? Or are you going to keep some ridiculous supply of parts in your warehouse? Um, that's all going to be expensive. You know? So it's important to try to get many of your parts produced you know, right in the country so you're sure you have access to them. So you get this new industry developing in Taiwan. Okay? By 1966, there's 20 companies that are producing radios for export. By 1964, you know, that's just three years after the first transistor radio factory is opened in Taiwan, you get the first foreign parts factory open. Okay? This is FDI. Okay, and the, it was often the foreigners that came in and made the most complicated parts because, you know, they had the, the experience with this technology. By 1968, you know, four years afterward, there's 14 foreign companies in Taiwan making parts, okay, for the radios. There's also a lot of Taiwanese firms that start making the parts for the radios, usually the simpler parts. And again, you know, Taiwan is very speed intensive when these companies find that they need a new part. Um, Taiwanese are pretty quick to look at the part and say, yeah, we'll figure out how to do that. And they often can figure out how to do that. Maybe some of these people are people that have had some experience working at the foreign firm. And so they can leave the foreign firm and they can, you know, they can learn how to make you know, some of the parts the foreign firm had been making and they do it themselves. Um, I suspect that it's these foreign firms that are most important in training these Taiwanese firms to make parts. It's possible that some of these parts producers you know, come from the old domestic industry that had been protected. But um, you know, when you're making mediocre radios for uh, uh, you know, small batches of these mediocre radios for the domestic market, you might learn more bad habits than you learn good habits. So you know, I think it's the, the foreign firms that are really key to, to training the Taiwanese personnel. TVs also become important. 1962 is when the first TV is produced in Taiwan. These TVs are being produced for domestic use. The government has begun setting up you know, broadcasting stations. They want to get their propaganda out to the people. And they also want to kind of expose more people to you know, more high-class Chinese culture. Okay. By 1966, there's 11 companies making TVs. They make a total of about 60,000 TVs a year. Now that's about 5,500 TVs per company. If you think about per company per week, you're only making about 100, 100 TVs every week. Each company is maybe making 100, 100 TVs a week. Very small scale production. Probably pretty inefficient production too. 60% okay? of the parts are domestic parts, and that again is because of government regulations. Okay? And these TVs are not competitive on the international market. You know, you have this captured Taiwan market and the Taiwanese consumers have to pay extra to get mediocre TVs. 
The real boom in TV production, though, comes in 1967 and then in 1968. 1967, I think toward the end of 1967, is when the, the first TV factory is set up to produce good TVs for international marketplace. Okay? And again, these are exports. There's no parts requirements. But again, parts companies are set up. Okay, and you, you do get parts being, being made. You can kind of see what's happening looking at, you know, these statistics. If you look at transistor radios, 1961, the first um, factory is set up. It's just being set up, so there's just a handful of radios produced. But, um, you know, within three years, there's half a million radios being produced. In four years, um, over a million radios being produced. And this keeps growing, you know, into the 1970s. TVs, you can see there's kind of this growth in the 1964, 65, 66. That's, that's for the domestic market. You're getting more companies kind of getting into the business. But the real jump comes from 1966 to 1968. Uh, the number of TVs being produced jumps by almost 10 times. Okay? So now you've got this huge number of TVs now being shipped to, you know, abroad. And um, again, you know, by 1968 to 1970, and, you know, the number doubles again, and it keeps growing in the 1970s. They, at the beginning, it's mainly black and white TVs. They'll eventually move into color. Tape recorders. Okay. That's something else that takes off at about the same time. There was some you know, early production in 66 and 67, but just, just very little. Okay. But then some company comes in to make tape recorders, again, for the international market, and boom. Okay. Tape recorder production you know, becomes, becomes you know, significant in Taiwan. To see how important the American consumer market is to Taiwan, you can take a look at the telephones. Telephones were a different sort of electrical consumer appliance than others in that AT&T, American Telephone and Telegraph, had a monopoly in the U.S. on telephone production. And they made their telephones in the United States. They weren't really interested in doing them abroad. So Taiwan didn't have any opportunity to make telephones for the United States. And because of this, you can see the telephone production in Taiwan stays you know, relatively low. Okay, because it's, they, they can't make stuff for the American market there. Um, I think it's the late 1970s when finally the monopoly breaks down, and then Taiwan does become important in making telephones for the U.S. Early on, why are these people coming to Taiwan? Okay. Well, very early on, one reason is the Japanese trading companies. Okay, they do get involved with this. I'm not sure if they're as important in, in the electronics as the um, as the they were in the, a lot of the other consumer products. You know, consumer product products. The, you know, the shoes and the clothes, okay, this sort of thing, but, but they certainly are important. And originally, it was Japan that started making some of these consumer electronics for the United States, so that kind of turned America's focus to East Asia, okay, and then the trading companies early on played middlemen, um, connected Americans to Taiwan, but within a year or two, there were already Americans coming to Taiwan um, to, to you know, set up foreign factories. Parts were also important. You know, I said in Taiwan, you had this speed intensive networks. If you know, you're, you're making something and you want to get it all set up and you're saying, we're missing these parts, we've got to import, this is very clumsy, what are we going to do? Well, if the part isn't too complicated, it's pretty easy to find a Taiwanese that will do it for you. And no matter how many parts you want, he can ramp up production really quick. He does it through his network of getting other people to, to subcontract. Okay, so it's very flexible. So that's important. It's also important that Taiwan at this time has opened FDI. Okay? They are pretty quick to allow in the firms that are want to do the more sophisticated parts. Uh, I think Taiwan, um, you know, there was some resistance, you know, kind of a, this idea of neo-imperialism, where you've got the foreigners coming and taking control of your economy. But as I said earlier, I think that you know Taiwan kind of started out with them you know, trying to attract overseas Chinese. That was kind of the way it started opening up to outside in, to outside investment. Maybe because this was somewhat successful, they were willing to move on and go much bigger um, with this, you know, for FDI. If you talk to Americans, though, that came as managers and worked in Taiwan in the 1960s, the one thing they like to talk most about is the labor force. And, you know, we talk about the labor force in these factories, it's mainly young women. Okay? Um, these young women, they said, would work cheaper and better than you know, almost any place else in the world. Um, you know, better than in the United States. Right? Why was this? You know, I'm, not, 
I'm not really sure about this. You know, do you, do you say there's something cultural here or is there something else going on? One thing I think that may be important, you know, is sometimes when you, um, when you talk to Taiwanese about the electronics industry, they'll claim that it was important that Taiwan had such a good education system. And that you know Taiwanese are Confucian, and so they very they're very concerned about education. And education allows them to do very well in high tech. Okay? But this isn't really true during this early period, okay? At least as far as say engineering is concerned. Okay? In the 50s and 60s and the 70s, you know the main purpose of Taiwan's education system was to assimilate Taiwanese to to Chinese culture. So it seemed like most of what was being done was memorizing Chinese poems, you know memorizing the names of, of Chinese dynasties and empire, emperors, um, you know, learning about Chinese geography. Um, the science and math wasn't, wasn't really emphasized much. And then when you got into the top universities where there were departments of electrical engineering, you find that many of the graduates, almost all the best graduates, ended up going on to graduate school in the United States. And then in general, they stayed in the United States. And that was good for Taiwan later on, that they had all these connections over there in Silicon Valley. But early on, it didn't help Taiwan much. But education, I think, does play an important role in maybe how it trains these young women. You know, Taiwan's education system was very traditional. You know, you go in there, it's very orderly. You know, there's a very authoritarian teacher who tells you what to do and you do it. Maybe that's really what these factories, you know, this is the sort of skills factories needed. The ability for you to quietly sit there for long periods of time and do the same thing over and over again, be told what to do and just do it and do it and do it, okay? So maybe in this sense, this education system really did have a, a great advantage, but I think the advantage was more probably in, in creating this basic labor force. South Korea fell behind Taiwan as far as these consumer electronics is consumed, concerned. Okay. I think up here I see early products of consumer electrons. It's electronics, of course. Um, South Korea's problem is that they were more hostile to foreign direct investment than Taiwan. And so they're very reluctant to allow these foreign direct investors to come in and say, open up parts plants. Okay. So eventually, South Korea does start moving into electronics. It does very well. But in the early years, they lagged Taiwan quite a bit. Now this is, that was the beginning of the electronics industry. Um, and it begins kind of with these transistors. Okay. Later though, the transistor is overtaken by this new thing, the integrated circuit. The integrated circuit basically is putting a number of transistors onto a little chip. Okay. Originally it's, you know, maybe, maybe ten, tens of transistors, or later on it's thousands, okay. And it's, it's growing all the time. Integrated circuits, though, is you know, you're putting all this, this stuff onto a really little chip and it miniaturizes everything. The integrated circuit industry has several stages to it. First, you have to design the integrated chip. How are you going to put on all these little gates and, and transistors? Where do you want to put them so that the chip does what you want it to do? Then once you've got a plan, you've got to make a mask, which is maybe kind of like a some sort of, it looks kind of like a blueprint, where it's going, which is going to allow you to kind of print what you want onto a chip. Then you've got to actually do the manufacturing. You've got to take the mask and you've got to start making lots and lots of chips. Then once you make the chips, the chips are really small. To use them, you're going to have to put them in packages. Each package has you know, connectors on it. And then eventually, you've got to, once you put them in packages, you've got to get the connectors and you've got to kind of connect it to a board so that you connect all the chips kind of together and what they need to connect to. You also need to test the chips, okay, and make sure they're okay. And then finally, you know, you kind of put a brand on them and you, you sell them. Okay, that's kind of the wholesaling and retailing part of it. Now, Taiwan begins with packaging, and that's the low-tech part of making integrated circuits. Okay, so basically, you know, they're giving you these piles of little chips, and you've got to have, you know, young women there with dexterous fingers getting the chips into their packages and all, all correct there. And then you've got to get those packages all connected to the boards. And then... If you're going to do the packaging in Taiwan, you don't want to ship it someplace else to do the testing. You know, if they come out bad, it's going to, this going to delay you. You want to get the testing done right in Taiwan, too. So that naturally follows. You get a lot of packaging and testing done in Taiwan. That's the start. 
These are chip packages. Uh, so different varieties of them. You can see, you know, they're used as a chip in each of these packages, and the, the connectors there are kind of linked to the chip, and they link the chip to, to the rest of the product. This is showing you kind of a chip on the board. You know, all the little connectors out there connecting to little pieces on the board, which is going to carry the current, you know, in and out. This is a big motherboard. This is the sort of thing you would find in, you know, on a computer. Okay, and um, it's um, you know, it's a uh, they've gotten all these different packages, and now they've connected all the packages to the board where they belong. This is the sort of work that the, you know Taiwan is mainly doing at this time in electronics. Now Taiwan was getting a lot of help from both Japan and the U.S. I think they were really learning more from the U.S. Japan was interested in Taiwan for, for two reasons. First, they were interested in Taiwan's domestic market. You know, Taiwanese like to buy the Japanese products. Often they couldn't just import them. The Japanese would set up partnerships with Taiwan companies um, to assemble Japanese products in Taiwan okay, so that they could be, they could be you know, sold in Taiwan. Um, and this was, you know, this was usually done with bigger companies, maybe like Datong. Okay. On the other hand, the Japanese were also interested in using the, the cheap Taiwanese labor. They were very important in the export processing zones. I think down in Kaohsiung, over half of the, the firms in the export processing zones were Japanese firms that were doing consumer electronics. And so they're using the Taiwanese women to, to put together, you know, package, to put together the IC packages and get the packages onto the boards and into, the, into their products. Okay, it's doing all the assembly. But the Japanese tended to you know, be less open to sharing technology with the Taiwanese, even when they were working together with big Taiwanese companies. Sometimes the most important um, parts, um, they would like to do that in Japan and you know, not really share the technology with, uh, with their Taiwanese, you know, Taiwanese partners. The U.S. was more open to sharing this. Um, the U.S. did a lot of OEM with Taiwan. Okay, OEM production basically is when the United States, the company, it kind of decides what product it wants, it designs the product, and then it goes to Taiwan and it says, this is what we want to do, can you do it? Okay, and then the Taiwanese firm has to figure out how to do it. Okay, often they go over and they talk to a number of firms and the firms all compete. Who can, who can do the project, you know, who can do this project and the best and the cheapest? And then eventually, the U.S. starts using ODM with Taiwan. The D here stands for design. And what would happen is that the Americans may come up with a product. Perhaps they've just got kind of a sketch for what they want done, but they don't really have it completely designed. And they go to Taiwan and they, they ask what Taiwan company can do this. And then the, the Taiwan company has to kind of work with them to actually get the design done. Sometimes, too, it could be that the, uh, the American company would take a design to Taiwan and the Taiwanese will look at it and say, well, we think it needs to be redesigned somewhat if you want to make this cheaper. So Taiwanese start learning more and more about how to design these products. Um, some people um, talk about Taiwan as Silicon Valley's secret weapon. And I've read one paper where the person suggested that, you know, that Taiwan saved Silicon Valley. Okay. Now what happens in Taiwan's electronics industry is after the war, it was the most advanced electronics industry in the world. But it kind of got captured by the military. Okay? So in these electronics firms, it seemed like they were mainly interested in producing very high-tech products for, say, you know, the U.S. Air Force. And you know, this is good business because if you know anything about military procurement, they don't really care much about the price. Okay? So you can make huge profit margins. Okay? Um, but the Japanese, what they do is they look at these technologies, they license a lot of the technologies, and then they figure out that, you know, actually we can take these technologies, we can use them in simpler products, and we can sell them to consumers. You know, it's not just, you know, big airplanes that need electronics, okay? There's a lot of consumer products that can also use electronics. So that's really where they kind of take off. They're the first to discover the consumer market. And by the 1970s, and really even into the 1980s, a lot of people thought that Japan was going to push the Americans out of the electronics market. Okay? It seemed to people that um, you know, Japan was now the high-tech company country. Um, each new high-tech product that came out, it seemed like it was Japan that was developing it, okay? and that the U.S. was falling further behind. Well, 
the U.S. in trying to catch up with the Japanese, and they did have the you know the engineers and you know the, in Silicon Valley that they could produce you know really good electronics, but they found when they started trying to catch up you know by pr producing things like consumer products, they didn't really have the manufacturing set up near as well as the Japanese did it, and they weren't sure how to handle this well. Okay? So what they ended up doing is they they you know get in contact with Taiwan, and Taiwan is very quick to start producing whatever the Americans design. Okay. So this is kind of the comeback that's made by the American companies, and the comeback comes through their work with Taiwan. Okay. And so, you know, it, it looked like in maybe 19, you know, back in 1980, some people might have imagined that, you know, it looks like probably the Japanese eventually will take over the computer market. But um, computers are dominated by American firms because they work with the Taiwanese, and the Japanese try to do it all in Japan. And doing things in Japan becomes harder and harder as the technology becomes faster and faster. Okay? Because the Japanese didn't work in these flexible networks. They tended to work you know, in, in, in big companies. So, you know, Silicon Valley was kind of seen as Taiwan, or Taiwan was seen as Silicon Valley's um, secret weapon, though maybe in the future, you know, you just see Taiwan surpassing Silicon Valley. And if it's, it's not in the long run, I'm not sure it'll work out to Silicon Valley's advantage. Around this time, and this is in the kind of mid-1970s, um, the Taiwan government called in um, an auditing firm. I think we were Arthur Little or okay, something like this. It was a U.S. auditing firm. They asked for a report. They said, look at our electronics industry and try to tell us how we can do things better. And an abbreviated version of this report appears in the Industry of Free China, a magazine that you, know, you can find here. Um, the, the auditing firm, it gave several criticisms. It said, first, your firms are poorly organized. Okay, that's, the, that's a big problem. And their capital equipment tends to be outdated. It's just not that good of capital equipment. You also have poor quality control. Okay, a lot of your stuff, the quality of it is pretty questionable. Another problem is you're depending on foreigners for marketing. Okay, maybe you should start doing your own marketing more. Finally, they said these firms have a problem and that they, they're reluctant to cooperate with the government. Okay, that maybe it would be better if you could figure out some way so that the government and the firms could start cooperating more. If you look at these criticisms, it's pretty clear that these criticisms are very similar to the criticisms that the Japanese made of Taiwan hat producers. And when the Japanese kept claiming that Taiwan's hat producers would never in the long run be able to compete with the Okinawan hat producers, of course the Japanese were wrong. And I think the American company was probably, American auditing firm was probably wrong too here. Okay. What they're seeing is they're just looking at a speed intensive industry. And I said when you have a speed intensive industry, you know, usually the bosses, they're best at, you know, the entrepreneurship side of the, the, of the game. They're often not specialized too much in organization. Also the capital equipment, you know, they want to use more variable factors of production. They don't want to use a lot of dedicated capital equipment. If you've got to use capital equipment, it should be multi-purpose, and the best thing to use is, is you know, laborers, particularly young, young women. Okay, they were very flexible. Quality control is always a problem in speed-intensive production because there's a trade-off between how good you're going to make this product and how fast you're going to get it to market. And with this trade-off, um, usually, you know, there is, of course, some basic quality standards you have to meet, but you're willing to sacrifice some quality just in order to get the, the product to market quickly. And Taiwanese did depend on foreigners for marketing. They had done that in the tea industry. They did that, you know, in the hat industry. They didn't really have any brands for that. I mean, the other consumer goods industry, not much branding with that. Um, in theory, you know, speed intensive producers might be able to, to do marketing, but the problem is, I guess probably even in theory it would be hard for them to do it because usually they're small and medium enterprises and it's, it's hard for a small and medium enterprise to, to, to have a brand because it's, it's, you know, it's, it's small compared to the market. Okay. Um, another problem is that building a brand takes a long time and uh, what the speed intensive producer does best is does things quickly. Okay. It's not really good at you know, looking at the long run. Okay. Um, so depending on foreign marketing, that's, that's pretty normal for a speed intensive industry. Okay. Reluctance to cooperate with the government, well, you know, there's nothing slower and more bureaucratic than a government. So, yes, probably speed intensive industry would tend to, to try to keep a distance from government. Okay? So, 
this, these criticisms are all true, but it's just, you know, there's a speed intensive industry, you know, there's kind of two sides to a coin. You know, there's the good side, you know, the fast speed and the flexibility, but then there's the, the drawbacks, okay? And it often is kind of, you know, poor organization and poor quality control, this sort of problem. You know, if you look at the tea industry in Taiwan, you know, I talked about the Taiwan tea industry versus the, the British tea industry in India. You know, clearly the British had better organization, they had better capital equipment, they had better quality control. Um, until the Japanese tried to start doing marketing for Taiwan, Taiwan really didn't have any sort of brand names. Um, and really the Taiwanese weren't that good at cooperating with the Japanese government. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Okay, the electronics industry in this way is very similar to the very first industry we looked at when we began looking at Taiwan's modern economic development. Okay, once you get integrated circuits, now you get a lot of new products. Okay, and these, Taiwan gets big on most of these products. Okay. First one, calculators. Taiwan becomes, you know, the main producer of calculators in the world. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. I'm going to talk about Kimpo in a second. Um, the um, video gaming. Taiwan also becomes very important in video games. Many of their computer producers started out doing video gaming. Digital watches. Okay, this becomes a big thing in the 1970s. I really can't remember why we were so excited about digital watches, but um, it, that was an exciting thing to be able to look at your watch. Usually you had to punch it to get the number. It was dark unless you actually pushed it, and that's because battery life was really low. But, um, boy, um, you know, if you had a digital watch, that really made you cool. Taiwan also does a lot of these digital watches and these, these video machines. Okay, the, the company I want to talk about, kind of representative of this type of business, is Kimpo. Okay. And Kimpo is a good story, you know, kind of showing how this electronics industry kind of comes out of the more traditional industries. Because, originally, this begins with a Santos group. The Santos Group was in the, you know, they had a big hotel, they were into construction, okay. they were a more traditional conglomerate, they were a fair sized conglomerate in Taiwan, pretty big, but they were a small conglomerate compared to what you see in Korea and Japan. Okay. Their son, it was, it was a family company, and their son was coming out, he wanted something to manage, he was more interested in electronics and audio sort of stuff, I guess, so they set up the Santron corporate company okay, for him in 1972. Now at this time, Barry Lam and Salen Wen, I think it's still in graduate school at NTU. Okay. Barry Lam is an interesting person. Okay. He's not Taiwanese. He's from Hong Kong. Okay. And at this time, um, you know, our Taiwan had a special program where they wanted to attract overseas Chinese students to their universities. They would let them in, you know, even if they had relatively low test scores. Barry Lam, I think at first he wanted to go to a Hong Kong university, but he tested really bad. He couldn't get into a, a good university, so he, he decided to go for Taiwan, and Taiwan let him into National Taiwan University's Department of Electrical Engineering. Okay? And he says he was one of the worst students there, you know, because they had all gotten you know, almost perfect test scores, because it was one of the toughest departments to get into. He, he hadn't done that well. But he said, you know, maybe he was more a hands-on person, because he really couldn't keep up with them as far as the theoretical tests were concerned. But he made a friend there with his sailing win. Okay. Um, they, you know, they struggle along. They manage to get through the program. After people graduate, again, you know, all the top students and most of the electrical engineering students, they go and they go to go to the United States. They get a graduate degree and they stay in the United States. They often end up in Silicon Valley. Okay. Barry Lam, he can't do that. Um, sailing win, I guess he stays too. Um, both of them end up getting into into use on graduate school, okay, and um, that's because uh, the graduate school can't attract that high caliber of student because all the good students are going to the U.S. But they start getting a little more attention there. They actually get the opportunity to build, I think, maybe the first um, personal computer in Taiwan. And they put together some components. They get the computer, and that gets them a, a prize, and they, they get on TV. Um, and that's when Santron notices them. Okay, so they, they get in touch with them and they say, would you, you know, you get your degree, would you like a job with our company? Okay, we're just starting up. And so they agree. Okay. When they get to Santron, they're interested in calculators and they make one of the first calculators in Taiwan. 
not the first, but it was it was one of the very early calculators. And you know, Santron starts making calculators and they make good profits with this. Okay, they get started up. It turns out though that Santron, you know, the, the, he's more interested in audio equipment, so he wants to keep calculators more of a sideline. Lam and Wynn, they wanna they wanna make calculators their main deal. So they leave Santron, they start up um, their own company, um, Kimpo. Kimpo becomes the, the most important calculator uh, manufacturer in Taiwan, and maybe in some ways in the world. They start making most of the calculators for the U.S. Okay? And if you look at the U.S. calculators, you won't find them labeled Kimpo. Um, you know, the, the Barry Lam, Sailing Wind, they just made the calculators on this OEM or ODM basis, and then, then the American company would take it and put their own brand name on it. Okay? So, um, they would make Texas Instruments calculators. Also made lots of you know, lots of calculators that um, aren't around anymore. Um, so they become the calculator kings. Okay? And then later, Kimpo moves on to making computer monitors because a big part of making these calculators is you know making the kind of the screen where you can see the digits. Okay? So eventually, it's kind of natural that when computers start getting big, they'll start trying to make these monitors. Eventually, then they're also going to move in to um, to another create another company where they start making computers. But Kimpo is still around. Okay? It's, a, it's still making calculators and now it's making a lot of other things as well. That's Barry Lam. Okay? And I think he's still around too. So that's how you know, the, 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 um, the electronics industry begins in Taiwan. Right? By 1973, there's over 70 foreign firms in Taiwan. They're mainly doing branding and quality control. That's the same as was in the tea industry. You know, tea industry was also the foreign firms gradually give up on the manufacturing and move into branding and quality control. There's over 600 Taiwanese firms um, doing packaging and assembling. And again, I've misspelled Taiwanese there. I'm sorry. I've got the I in the wrong place. And then, you know, there's also, besides these 600 plus firms, there's probably thousands of firms out there making parts and just little unlicensed firms, you know, these living room factories. So they're, they're just innumerable. Okay? So this becomes, you know, a big part of Taiwan's consumer goods exports. Okay? It's making these electronic goods. And gradually then these companies start moving into computers. We'll talk about that in the next unit.